season four, The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actor Alan Miller and artist Lisa Adams. And you see Lisa's paintings on the set. When you see Alan Miller's face, you'll think he looks familiar. That's because you've seen him in hundreds of films and TV shows and dozens of plays, Alan. Alan's been on the stage as an actor and actually on the stage as a director, too. Which do you prefer, acting I or directing? I love switching. I love going back. <laughs> you love switching? That yes, sounds like yeah. your new play, switching. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, oh, yes. Indeed. We are family. You we do a little family. switch there. Yeah, well, I mean, like all the pleasures in life, you, you don't want the same meal every night. So uh, it's good to have a, a home cooked meal and go out at night, you know? And, and going between acting, directing, and teaching, which I do as well, is a real pleasure for me because there are different gratifications in both, in all those areas. Does one hamper you from doing the other better or does it help you to do things better? It helps better? me. It helped does me it? enormously. When Lee Strasberg encouraged me to be a teacher, I thought acting was my whole life. But somehow or other, he felt that I had uh, things to offer as a teacher and got me my first job, as a matter of fact. And the teaching has helped the acting. And then when I became a director, the directing has helped the teaching and the acting. Did Lee Strasberg teach? Teach? Me? No, teach. Did he, would, did he believe in teaching? Oh, yeah. Because oh, that yeah. was what he, uh, rather oh, than just acting, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I so believe, he, he believed in training. He believed in knowledge of the theater. I mean, he was inspiring. In all aspects, He was huh? inspiring in all kinds of ways. But so was my first teacher, who was Erwin Piscotter at the Dramatic Workshop. Where Brando went and a whole bunch of really wonderful actors came out of. But that reminds me, because when I was reading your resume, I saw a list of that kind of actor, uh, Streisand and I, I can't Meryl even Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman and a whole bunch of other people whom I trained, helped did train. Did you train? Yes. And did you train them specifically for specific jobs or was it just like an acting class? Uh, it was an acting class, but I also helped people specifically. Coaching. Coaching That's is where it's one-on-one -on -one for yeah. a particular part or a particular piece that they're working on. And the teaching is uh, a group of people, so you have a chance to work with other individuals as well as yourself. So could you have but, a train, I mean, a very well-known actor or actress in one of your classes just with yeah. People that you're just starting out? Yes. It's yes. happened any number of times. Sure. And do they sit and learn the same way? Yeah, sometimes an actor who's been acting for a good while needs refreshing. That's what I begin to take him or herself for granted. Wants to remind themselves of what it feels like to be inspired. That wonderful word that nobody knows how to define inspired. I mean, there's not an actor around who's worth anything who wouldn't want to be a marvelously exciting inspirational kind of actor. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while you see some actors who you believe are, are like that in parts they do. Or Judy Dench now is coming into so much notoriety for the kind of work that she's been doing for years. And Anthony Hopkins. And right. Those people were inspired. Yeah. Sometimes. Can you inspire but I've, people? But I've seen Anthony Hopkins, well, yeah. not inspired. But uh, can you inspire your actors? Is no, that what no, you do? No, but, but you, but you you leave room for, you can train people to leave room for inspiration to occur. In other words, inspiration, you don't know it is until it happens. Uh -huh. You can't oh, presume right. it. Exactly. That's if you true. prepare yourself only for what's expected, you can't ever be inspired. So you have to leave space. Every, and every part I've done in the last 20 years, major roles I'm talking about, I have left spaces where I'm not sure exactly which way I'm going to go. Oh, and so then that, do you so decide that, or does the director decide which well, way you're you going to go? I'll give you a specific example. I was doing a play called Are You Now or Have You Ever Been, which right. was a big success out here. And I played Abe Burroughs, and it was a certain point in one of the performances where I broke up a line. I, uh, not intentionally, I just said that the audience started laughing so hard that I had to wait for it, and then I countered with another thing that got another laugh. 
And the director liked that and said, let's, and Keep I liked it, it. I thought it was wonderful too. So every night I knew I had to laugh. I had you to laugh to. at a certain point. I, I got a laugh out of a laugh I did. And I knew I had to laugh every night, but what I laughed from was never always the same thing. But it was the inspiration that you broke that line yes. up that night, yeah. the yeah. first time yeah. you did it. Yeah. I mean, you were and like then, acting yeah. it, and then that's how it that's came out. That's what happened. And then yeah. I had to fulfill it time after time right. and still try to keep it fresh. Well, before we go away from teaching, because yeah, yeah, you're yeah. teaching us, you've yeah. written a book called A Passion for Acting. Yes. And does that explain what you're telling us now? Yes, it does. Yes. And so in, in very real, rich detail from actors that I've seen do inspired work. Uh, so you can just pick this up and kind of get a feeling of what yeah, it's uh, not just a Alan textbook. Miller says. It's not just a textbook. It's, it's, it's um, a defining and a clarifying of some of the wonderful things that I have seen happen and I've helped happen and what processes were at work. So we've talked about stage, acting and directing. You've mm -hmm. been in hundreds of TV shows and films and do you like the stage better yes, than yes, no, yes, yes, better yes. than film and TV? Yes, 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 yes. You're alive on stage. On TV, you can do another take and another take and another take and another take, and by the time they print it, you don't even know which part of you they they kept. And you, and you have no inspiration and you, left. And I, well, you try. I mean, obviously, you try to do it as well as you can. But stage, uh, it's you and that audience that night are the only people who are going to see what the experience is. Well, one of the things. You did a yeah. tape, but auditioning. Yeah. But it's an auditioning tape for Actors. movies. No, no, no it's for oh, no. any kind of auditioning. Uh. Yeah, because in all my time as a director and a teacher and an actor, I've seen maybe 10,000 auditions. And I'd have to say, unfortunately, at least 9,500 were abysmal. Uh, Most people fall apart when they audition. So what do you teach them to do? I teach them how to stay creative when the chips are down. When you feel like you're failing, how do you stay creative? So we have this in this tape, okay. Okay. okay? Now we <laughs> now we can now we can go on. <laughs> we can go on to your directing. Well, directing uh, is just uh, 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 there's a piece of material I feel things about. Sometimes you feel that way about a part. I feel that way about a piece of material, and I feel like I can bring it to life in special ways. As a director. But does that idea that you're an actor and a director and a teacher, say, affect you when a director tells you what to do on stage? No. No. I have never been fired. <laughs> I, I didn't I, mean fired. No, no, no. I've never <laughs> not done what a, what a director has asked me to do first. Uh -huh. Then I reserve the right, if I feel that way about it, strongly. To say, now that I've done it this way, could I try showing it to you that way? Oh, you 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 feel I, comfortable to do that? Yes, yeah, sure. And I've never been turned down. And and is it something, or do you have to know how to read your director before uh, you can uh, just say, oh, do it my way? Well, sure. I mean, acting, directing with another human being is constantly getting in touch Knowing, with who that person right, is. Right. I mean, the play that we're doing right now. It's for people constantly in touch and out of touch and touch and in out but of touch. But you're on the s stage, I would say, the whole time. <laughs> I, I never leave the stage until the end of the play. I yes. mean, you get dressed and undressed on the stage. <laughs> I just do all sorts of things on stage. I yeah. wondered about how your physical stamina for, it's Murray Shishkel's play, yeah. We Are Family, and yes. it's at the Odyssey. Yeah. And it's amazing. This guy gets on, he puts his shoes on, he takes them off, he puts his shirt on, he takes his jacket off, he goes in the bedroom, he comes back. I make love to Salome Jens. I, you know, I How do good could that things. be? You make love to any guy that comes <laughs> any, along. <laughs> I try to get my best friend to be a possible gay partner. It's a hoot of a play. It's extremely funny. And uh, the characters are constantly shifting in relation to one another. But it, the director then, at that point, yeah. really uh, has to choreograph your, all of your moves, doesn't he? Sure. So that you're like in but, different parts yeah, of... Yeah, but we are free to suggest something instead of... A, but I'm saying in terms of me uh, arguing with the director, it, it just doesn't happen. Oh, I just yeah. say, okay, let's do it like this and then do it as well as I can. And once I've done that, I feel the privilege for me to say, how about if we also try this? When you... Um, are in this play and you say you're trying, you're questioning your masculinity. Yeah. Or not your masculinity, no, no, no because... No. I'm questioning the society's 
rules of relationship between men and women right. that ruin so many men women relationships. Right. It's not your masculinity, but no. when you come on to your boyfriends or when you come on to your old friends, my not your best, boyfriend, my oldest your best friend <laughs> who's had a wreck in his life right. also. Do you change your body language? Yeah. Yeah, so that every you, once in a while. That, yeah, does yeah. that affect yeah, but, your... But it's, I mean, I actually say to him at a certain point, do you find me physically unattractive? I mean, right. he said, no, no. I said, okay, then could we just entertain this possibility between us? Could we just try out this idea? But I, don't, I think you're being like really masculine when you're doing I that. I do it. I do it as masculinely as I can. And then when do you change to be, show a little bit of gayness to I, your... I don't, I oh. don't, I don't do that... Uh, you don't do that physically. No, oh, I just try I to make the relationship I see. I see. more meaningful I between see. us than it has been between me and my female uh, I see. wives and partners right. over the years. But then the minute you're the female comes on stage because you've got three guys on there for the whole first yeah, act. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Three guys interacting. No, no, the first act is just the two of us. Oh, just the two of you. Oh, then, then the, the, the third second guy, right. old friend comes in. Right. And I'm, I try, des my character tries desperately to see if he can just get something to work out here where he can behave gayly. So he can you know? have this life. So he can have this life without all these problems. Right. Right? You know, like in the movie, like Hajo Fall, those right. guys had such a terrific relationship. Right. Just, I've never had that in my own marriages. So he tries to get that done, and then sure enough, when that woman comes in the door can't help and it. things start happening to him, he can't deny that this he's is attracted it. to women. Right. You read, you did this play in Sacramento. Yeah. It's a new play, it, it but was, you it did it. Was it a reading, a workshop? No, no, it was produced up there. It was. But, but we workshopped it in the sense that Murray Shizgal came up to work on the script. The script was unwieldy. Uh. And for 10 days, we hacked out different possibilities, juxtapositions, editing, changing, rewriting, and but so on. But all of you together, the whole cast? Yeah, there was a different cast up there. But how did you change? How does the cast change? I mean, how did you stay in it? Well, some and the people, cast some people were not available. The director of this production had different ideas of casting. I Luckily, see. they both liked me. I see. That's <laughs> what I was wondering because yeah. if you were, say, the originating yeah. or the original, what yeah. Sam? Sam. Yeah, yes, you were yeah. the original. Yeah, Sam. I mean, if Murray didn't like me doing it, I wouldn't be in it. And if the new director, John Shuck didn't like me oh, doing see. it, then oh, I, I wouldn't be in it. So that's how the cast changed oh, yeah. in that respect. Yeah. I mean, he had readings. He saw uh, at least one of the people from the other cast, and um, it didn't work out for whatever reasons. That's his decision. Uh -huh. And I didn't interfere with the casting. That was not my business. But he did like me, so I stayed in the company, and we got three other people. Was Murray... Um, Here? I know Murray was in Los Angeles. Was he in Sacramento? Yes, yeah, you said yeah. he was in Sacramento. Yeah. Did he have anything to do with the directing in Sacramento? I, I, he would have liked to. <laughs> That's what I wonder. How do you write something uh, and then and be yeah, sitting yeah, in a yeah, workshop well, and let someone well, else do it? Because he's a professional. He's been around long enough to know that you know you have your own idea, but you have to give that idea a chance to go because it might do better for the material than what your idea was. Yeah, sure. Coming back from Sacramento, uh, come back to the Odyssey where your show is playing. The Odyssey is a great, it has three stages. Yeah, it's a it's, wonderful place to work. It's in. doing, it does such great things. Ron Saucy has worked there for 30 years or yeah, more. And, and so much original material comes out of there. And he's, he's really terrific. You um, actually directed a play there. A I've perfect. directed four. Oh, you have? Three, four. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I've been in at least one, two, three. So it's, it feels comfortable for you then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a working place. It's a place for you to feel you can discover and try out. Mm -hmm. It's not cut and dried. You know, there's nothing that Ron ever stands for that's just superficially nice and okay. Well, this was not a cut and dry interview today. Thank you. <laughs> you, you crossed all the borders. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. My pleasure. Thanks, Alan Miller, for being with us. And don't go away. We'll be right back with artist Lisa Adams.
that far. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with artist Lisa Adams, who earned a BA from Scripps, where she studied art, and an MFA in 1980 from Claremont University. She also taught at Claremont, as well as Otis College and University of California at Riverside. Her work's been exhibited all over the world, and the big question is, Lisa, did you always want to be an artist? I did. You did? I did. <laughs> That's I always did. good to know, because some people start mid-career. No, no, no. I, I, um, I drew and painted from the time I was very young. And um, in fact, when I was a kid, I used to pull out the drawers uh, in the kitchen, and I used to draw underneath the drawers. Is that right? And, and underneath the kitchen table. With mm -hmm. just with anything Pencil, you could do. Pencil, crayon, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I always knew that I would be an artist, and when I, um, when I turned about 10, I decided I would be a professional artist, even though I had no idea. At 10 years old? Yeah. <laughs> even though I had no idea what that meant. So this question about asking if you were working before you got to Scripps, you were working, I was weren't working you? Before, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was. But were you, did you take any other art classes, or how, um, you, how did you choose Scripps? That would be the last place I think would be an art school. Um, actually, they have a very good art department. They do, and uh, and I benefited greatly by it because I was there on all scholarships and grants. Uh, so. Um, so from high school. Well, in, in high school, I was I actually went to Claremont High School, so I was living in oh, Claremont. Oh no wonder you. And, were out and there. I rode my bike to Scripps one day. And I decided that this looked like a pretty good place to go to school. I was about maybe 16. Ah. And so I went in and I talked to them. And uh, we, you know, they gave me an admissions packet. And I, I you know, applied like everybody else. So that's, that's how that all came about. Mm -hmm. um, you have a show. You've, you had a lot of shows. You have a show at Patricia Correa Gallery right now in Santa Monica. And one of the the press releases said that your work is infused with mystery. Mm. Yeah. And do you think in mystical terms when you are painting? Uh, I don't think I don't think I would call them mystical terms, but I do. I do reserve areas, I think, within the painting that, that uh, remain unresolved, so that I can kind of go back in and, oh. and work. So in that, that would manner. be the mystery of it. To me, it, they're mysterious to me as well. I mean, I know a little bit about them, but I don't know a lot yet. I think it takes a long time. Uh, because of the way I work, I think it takes a long time for me to really figure out what it is I'm doing. And what influences uh, come into play then? I think, well, this idea about imperfection. Should we talk this is yeah, imperfection? Yeah, the idea about imperfection, that's actually the title of the exhibition, Imperfection came from a residency that I did in um, Japan in 2000. And um, one of the things that I realized about living in Japan is how incredibly tracked people are on perfection. Yes, exactly. And, and what happened was it, it made me so crazy after a certain point in time that I couldn't imagine anymore how perfect is perfect. How, how perfect do things really have to be? So, so when you were an uh, artist in residence there, you were dealing, I guess, with this total perfection, weren't you? But that could have been a mystery to you as well. How it was completely it, like that. it was completely a mystery to me how people could agree upon that so thoroughly. I mean, I think. You mean like so everybody had the yeah. same idea? Yeah. I mean, it all was yeah. the same. Absolutely the same. So, but <laughs> what's what's so amazing about living in a place, say like Los Angeles? is you can't get any agreement, right? Totally. What's We're incredibly beautiful to someone else, someone else can't even look at, you know? And it has no meaning, you know? So it's, it's uh, that was different for me, to be in a culture that was in agreement. So imperfection, is it skewed toward a different way from perfection, so to speak? Yeah, yeah I, I hope. Mean, I mean, is it <laughs> skewed that way? Is that um, what you're thinking? Well, it, in part. You know, I think the task for being perfect would be so difficult for me <laughs> that, I, know, just what that you I would be insane at the end of the day. So I, so I'm thinking the best I can do is work with what I have, which is I'm, I'm imperfect, and I'm imperfect in a unique way, as is everyone, you know. And and how does this show it? 
Well, this, this is a little motif that I use from time to time, which is this notion of above ground and underground, uh -huh. or above ground and underwater, you know? These kind of two realities, I guess, that simultaneously exist. And what kind of material do you use? Uh, these are all oil paint on panel. And do you build the panels? I didn't build these, but, but I do but you generally. Do, I mean, yeah. does it have to be a certain kind of wood or something? Well, kind it's of? just kind of standard. This stuff called Luan, which but is is a, that part? That's part of your painting, probably, mm -hmm. because it gives mm -hmm. a feeling. Right, right. And the and the other one. And this this one is another um, maybe re a little bit reoccurring motif. It's it's the notion of a round bottom bucket. Uh huh. Yeah, and how does that can't go? Can't be perfect either. Can <laughs> how it? does that go? It's either going to go one way or it's going to go the other because it can't sit very comfortably. Right. You know? And what does it tell you? It well, the thing the thing about the paintings that, to be honest with you, I always look at these exhibitions of mine, and I'm always slightly disappointed in the fact that everything seems so symmetrical. <laughs> That's that everything seems too, isn't so it? So stable and symmetrical, or two of everything. And it really kind of bothers me because I like to think of myself as being kooky. You know what I mean? But that's, <laughs> that's not very that's kooky. That's really funny because I have a painting of yours. It's egg shaped and it's mm -hmm. symmetrical too. Yeah. It's like two pieces here and two pieces here. Right. Always. And always. they fit the frame. Always. I know. But you couldn't have learned that just in Japan during that residency. No, no, no. It's, this has been going forever. Else. Yeah, it's been yeah. going forever. You were. Uh, you've gotten a lot of. Uh, artist in residence grants. I, have. I mean, you've worked a lot in foreign countries. You worked in Heidelberg, Germany. I went to school in Heidelberg. I went to oh, college. That's right. You went to school there. Mm -hmm. I forgot that. And right. then um, I've, I was in 1996 Fulbright, and my uh, appointment was in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, which is the capital city of Slovenia. Slovenia at that time was only about five years independent. Did you get to choose that place? I did. And what, what other choices did you have? Well, the Fulbright is actually, it's, it's a little bit complicated situation, but the Fulbright is basically made up of two systems. One would be um, what they have open calls, like they would like to have an artist in resident, or they'd like to have a computer you mean in a scientist. Place. Right. Uh -huh. And then they have something All else right. called any field, and you can then construct your own. It, it was easier for me and more likely that I would get my first choice if I went with an open, um, oh, an open call I where see. they were asking for someone. To some spe specific Correct. spot. Correct. And, and there was one um, that also at that time in Greece, but I had been to Greece, uh -huh. and so I thought... Oh, I think it's great to go to an Eastern European oh, country. I, it's, it's, it, How long were it, you there? It totally changed my life. I was there uh, five months, and then I spent one month traveling through Turkey by myself. Were there other artists with you in the program or not? Not, not foreigners. I was dealing just, uh, I was dealing only with the Slovene people at oh, the Art were. Academy. So I was teaching graduate students painting. Oh, you were, that was part of it, teaching? Mm-hmm. Well, how, that, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you because you have these intangible thoughts, you have these thoughts that are mysterious. How do you teach that to somebody? Yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing. Yeah, I it's like you're teaching something intangible, aren't you? Yeah, you are. I mean, you can teach people technique, of course. Right. You, you know, and I do a lot of that. I teach a lot of technique, and I think that's a very learnable thing. I think it's great to have technique, but I think the only way to really teach someone the step beyond technique, the art part, is to really be an example of the kind uh -huh. of artist that you believe yourself to be, you know, that you believe in yourself. This is the model that I would like people to see. That's interesting because I know the, the graduate program at UCLA, mm -hmm. the painters paint right alongside their students because yeah, I, I guess it's, it's like part of just what you're saying. Yeah, it's, I think it's so important for students hmm. to see their professors be real practicing artists That's out in the field, you know, because we go through collapse right in front of them. We're crying, we're anxious, we, they see our vulnerability. You know, it's not as professional as you would like to think, right? Yeah, because you're solving problems, you're trying to work the next right. canvas, whatever. You're emotional. It's it, that is interesting, uh, the way you've depicted teaching the intangible. And I guess it's the, what you do as a parent. You I teach suppose. by Example. Your example. Yeah, Same I suppose. Thing. You also, from uh, 
that Fulbright, you went to Helsinki. And we did, had a which is just, if you've been, it's just a marvelous, incredible place. But is it so different from that? Oh, but you know, I went 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle. I went to see the Sami people, which we call the Laplanders. Oh, right. And, and um, actually, I was hitchhiking up there. <laughs> and, and because it, but I've had such great fortune, you know, to go to these residencies. I go by myself. I've traveled the world by myself. And you just apply, you just read, if, yeah. if uh, an artist wanted to do it, you yeah. just read what's available and you apply. But have you learned, has your art changed from oh, all these different places? That's why I do it. That's exactly why I do it. It's such a profound influence on me and my work. And uh, it, because what you're doing is you're asked to go into a culture, you cannot speak the language, you don't know much about the people, and just imbibe the culture in whatever way you can. And so you rely a lot on your visual acuity and all your intuitions. It's the most primal way you can function in the world. Have you been healthy in those situations? Mentally. But <laughs> physically. <laughs> I'm not going to judge your mental um, health. Physically, have you had... Is, I've been okay. been okay. I had one mishap in Turkey that led to some stitches. But that was wasn't difficult. even on one of your residencies. No, this it was, was just traveling a, alone. a travel, yeah. But, but do, do they take care of you in a way? Is there At the residencies? Um, it, it depends. They're quite different from one another, you know. Uh, I'm going in August to Costa Rica. Tell for us just a little bit about what happens. At a residency? Yeah. It depends. Um, you're generally given a studio and a uh, little apartment. Sometimes they're combined. Oh, it's part of them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're dislocated from uh -huh. each other. Uh -huh. But you have some sort of lodging. And um, I think most of them expect you to pay for your food. Some of them not. Uh -huh. um, some of them pay for you to travel. Uh -huh. um, so they're all different aspects. But you always get a studio. Some demand uh -huh. that you show them work or have oh, a little that's exhibition. The other thing. Do you have to do but anything? But most not. You know, mo it's like an artist's vacation villa. Uh huh. But you're working, and a true professional will go into a situation like that and work. Yeah. Um, before we go, I wanted to ask you about your independent curating, mm -hmm. which you've done. I, I did for um, two years, um, 2000 and 2001. I was the co-director and co-founder of a little alternative space in Santa Monica, which is called Crazy Space. And I co-founded that with a woman named Lauren Hartman, who still is an active part of that organization. Ah. And what did you just find uh, um, emerging uh, artists? At that time, right, well, we worked with a lot of different people, mostly experimental things, things ah. that wouldn't normally find a home in a commercial space. Mm -hmm. and, and they're still going strong. They're dedicated in, to s great measure uh, to performance and so forth now. Well, I'm so glad you were with us today, Thanks, Lisa, Jennifer. and I'm so glad you brought the art. It looks fabulous, and, uh, and I know your show looks great, and uh, keep thinking about us when you're gone on all these residencies. <laughs> and you keep writing to us, 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 917, and we'll answer all of your questions, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.